Good morning. What a strange morning this has been. Uh, we're re-recording right now because we're not sure what happened with Facebook on uh, Sunday morning in our service. Uh, when I, uh, for 14 years, my wife and I w w served a church in western Pennsylvania, Beaver Falls, near uh, Pittsburgh, just north of Pittsburgh. And it was a, it was a blue collar community. The steel mills were dying, a lot of unemployment. It was a tough, tough place. And it was a long ways. It was a beautiful place, hills and valleys. It was a long ways from the prairies and the farms that I grew up among in northeastern South Dakota. I miss South Dakota. And one day, somebody told me about a thing they saw in the newspaper that there was going to be a picnic in Pittsburgh for people from North and South Dakota. Couldn't believe it. So we went. It was great. We get there. There's maybe 30, 40 people at the most. There's a board with a map. It has both of our states together because when we still had paper maps, they always put our states together. And we had to put a pin in where our town was and everything. And then we got name tags. And if you were from North Dakota, you got a blue one. And if you're from South Dakota, you got a red one. And uh, we put our name tags on and our names. And do you know what happened next? Can you imagine? Can you guess? Now here's where it got interesting. Because remember, all of us, this little group gathered in Pittsburgh, are a thousand miles or more from our homes. And even though we all had the same accent that people thought was funny, and uh, even though we had all, as North and South Dakotans, borne the indignity of other people who could not find our states on the map and wouldn't recognize the shape of our states and didn't know the capitals of our states, even though we had borne all that together, and even though there were so few of us, not just in the park, but generally, once we put those name tags on, we didn't talk to people who had the other colored name tag. Now, I grew up 12 miles from the North Dakota border, so I was closer to most North Dakota towns than South Dakota towns. But I didn't talk to anybody from North Dakota after that. I only talked to somebody from Sioux Falls, 200 miles away. What's with us? What makes people do that? Why are we like that? Unity is a difficult thing to achieve. About a year ago, February 22nd, Susan and I moved here to Rockford from the suburbs of Chicago. We were in Lincolnshire, north of the city. I came here to be near our son and daughter-in-law, which is delightful. We had served this uh, church in Lincolnshire for 22 years to the day, and it was wonderful. And then coming here, we had to find a new church. We had three Sundays to look at churches, visit churches before COVID hit. And uh, we were stuck at home. So we started looking at churches online and watching this and that. And I remember well in May, the morning we found uh, Mosaic and watched and listened to Pastor Dave preach and Rob led us in songs. And I don't know, God just seemed to direct us toward this congregation. We felt that like this was a place where we needed to be. And then we found out <clears throat> pretty quickly that there were these talks going on to merge Mosaic Church with um, Temple Baptist. Well, to me, that was really great news, not only because it's just a great idea, but I knew that Temple Baptist, hidden in their past, was that they were Swedes. I'm Swedish. I was born in Stockholm, South Dakota. So the blessing that would come upon Mosaic, let alone on me, to merge a Swedish church with this hodgepodge that was Mosaic, clearly it was a miracle and a blessing of God. So we were very excited about it. Well, no surprise to any of you, this hasn't been a great time for two churches to try to merge, has it? Here we are, November 1st, we merge. Had some Sundays we couldn't even be together. We've never all been together. Never all been in the same room. Even when we're in the same building, we can't be in the same room. We haven't even seen each other's faces yet. We've never had a potluck. We've never sat in a circle together and prayed. Just this morning was my first chance to meet Pastor Key for just a moment. 
He's the only one from the Burmese congregation that I've ever gotten to meet. This is a hard time to merge two churches. <clears throat> and on top of that are the, is the turmoil of this last year that all churches have faced. What the pandemic has created, all the problems it's created. The, uh, honestly, the fights and the tensions over the silliest things like masks. Breaking churches. The racial tensions of last summer in a town like Rockford, in a congregation like this one, has affected different people in different ways. The election. You know, don't you, that we didn't all vote for the same person? And yet here we come together. It's a hard time for churches to be together, let alone to merge. But God called you, called us, to do this at this time. And praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ, we get to do this. We get to have this adventure with him. Susan and I are really excited to be part of this. We are working hard to get to know each other, to get to know you all. We study our directory. Listen, in this city of Rockford, a city of split churches, don't have to be very long here to learn that, a city of split churches and scores of churchless Christians. We, as Crosspoint, want to be a church that displays the beautiful and miraculous unity that Christians have in Jesus. That's what we want to be. That's our privilege. Together, we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So that's the reason I would like us to look at John 13, 34, and 35. Would you turn there in your Bible? John 13, 34, and 5. This is happening at the Last Supper. That chapter deals with the Last Supper. And uh, it's the last night of Jesus' life. And after the supper itself, he, ha he teaches them these last words, these extraordinary things. And the top thing he starts with, the first order of business, point one on Jesus' teaching, are these verses. He repeats the same phrase three times, each with a different nuance. And you see it there on your screen. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There's no other passage in the Bible, uh, certainly not where Jesus spoke, that emphasizes something like this so strongly and so succinctly. This command, love one another, appears 12 times in the New Testament. And it is the basis for all kinds of other passages. I just read 1 Corinthians, where Paul is admonishing the church to stop fighting about all kinds of different things. Over and over and over, the message is unity. We have to love one another. It's not easy. That's what we're called to do. So brothers and sisters, here at Crosspoint, separated as we are, this weird morning right now to have to preach on a videotape to you. But still, this is our number one task. Love one another. So let's look at those three statements. The first one, Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another. The question is, what's new about it? In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, we have the command, love your neighbor as yourself. It's the text Jesus used when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. This is not that. Jesus isn't just repeating that command. When he said to love our neighbor as ourself, the story seems to indicate that that is anyone we run into in life, especially who is in need, that we are to love them. That's distinctive. It wasn't really in the minds of the Jews who had learned Leviticus 19. But here Jesus' focus is inward. 
love one another. He's not talking about all the people we know. He's not talking about your family. He's talking about us as a group of disciples gathered around Jesus. The Jews had a bad reputation. Uh, A Roman historian said that they were haters of the human race because they didn't like other people. They kept walls between them and everyone else. They were disdainful of anybody who wasn't Jewish. But now Jesus says, I have a new command. Love one another. The one another was going to be the surprise to these disciples. That was the surprise. They looked around, they saw guys pretty much like themselves, even though they came from different places, everything from a a zealot to a tax collector. That was a big enough change, but they had no idea what Jesus had in store for them. Jesus' command here lays the groundwork for the day when his followers would become a family like no one in the world had ever seen before when his followers would become a family like no one in the wor- uh, none in the world that anybody had ever seen before. In Jesus' day, no one, whether they were Jewish or Roman or Greek, no one would ever, ever refer to someone outside of their blood relations as brother and sister. A man's highest obligation wasn't to his wife, it was to his brother. We are common, we commonly speak of other people as brothers and sisters. You know, our brothers in the army, or our our sisters that we get together with, these women that we love to be with. That was not the language that they were used to. So when Jesus had disciples sitting in front of him, someone comes and says, "Uh, Master, your mother and brother and sisters are waiting to talk to you. He said, He pointed to his disciples and said, these are my mother and my brothers and sisters. That's radical. And now that same idea is brought here. A new command. Love one another. Paul wrote in Galatians, now there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Our church here, Cross Point, exemplifies that like crazy, doesn't it? I mean, we're all kinds of people. We've got all kinds of uh, categories and backgrounds and stories and ethnicities. That's a wonderful thing. We would never connect anywhere else. We would never sit in the same room were not, were not for Christ. We would never do stuff together if it weren't for Jesus. And here we are, brothers and sisters. That's new. There's another thing that's new. The old command was to love your neighbor as yourself. That is, our love for ourselves, the way we take care of ourselves, protect ourselves, and so forth, became the moral standard for how we treat others. It's a golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a good moral standard. And it applies to people anywhere, of any religion. Anybody should be able to say that. When people talk about the Jesus' good teaching, well, there it is. Something everybody can affirm, no matter what their religious background. But that's not what's new. What's new is what Jesus really exposed later that same night when he went to pray. John 17 concludes what he says that evening to his disciples, and it's a long prayer. And in that prayer, he asks his father that, listen to this, the love you, Father, have for me, Jesus, may be in them, Jesus' disciples, and that I myself may be in them. The picture is that the love that, the, that exists binding the Father, Son, and Spirit in the Trinity now can flow into the followers of Jesus and be extended through us as his body to other people. 1 John says, in this world, you are like Jesus. That's an astonishing thing. That's what's new. Christians can love each other particularly, and others too, with the very love of God himself. 
because we live in that love through the Holy Spirit. So now, not only do we love our neighbors as ourselves, but we are able to love one another as the Father and the Son love each other. Isn't that amazing? So never say, I just can't love that person. We can. We have a capacity to love that we've barely begun to understand. That's what's new about it. Well, let's look at that second phrase. The second statement, verse 34 again says, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's a little different, isn't it? As I have loved you. Now we must love one another as Christ has loved us. What do you think that means? What do you think that means? Notice in your Bible how this chapter begins. John tells us at the beginning of this night that Jesus washes his disciples' feet as portrayed in the picture you're seeing. They were stunned by this. And that is still heavy on their minds. They've gone through the Last Supper, and now Jesus says this, as I have loved you, you must love one another. They are connecting this naturally to what's just happened to them, this foot washing. We might look at this and think of this story and think, the lesson for me is that just like Jesus served his disciples, we need to serve each other. Well, that's true. The interesting thing is, for me at least, and for most of us, Serving each other at church is usually fun. It's good. It's satisfying. It's rewarding. I was glad to be asked to preach and provide this service. I'm glad that Nan asked us to be greeters at the south door, rookie greeters down at the south door. I'm excited about that. I like that job. And if you come to the south door next Sunday, we'll give you free hand sanitizers. Huh? Come and see us. I love that. We like serving singing or taking care of kids or handling the finances or cleaning the building or whatever it is. Most of us do service a lot of the time that we really enjoy. It doesn't really seem to be the point of this foot washing story. Have you ever seen this painting that's on the screen? It's by Ford Maddox Brown. It depicts, of course, Jesus washing the feet. It captures this. I want you to see the pieces of this, so I'll show it to you in pieces. Start by looking at Peter's face. Remember how shocked Peter was? You're not going to wash my feet. I'm not going to. That's, that's humiliating for you to wash my feet. Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, then you can't be part of me. Now, look at the astonishment of the disciples in the background. See him? Can you see the guy on the far left? I think it's the one with... Maybe his hands on his head. I think that's Judas. Do you notice what's in front of him on the table? The little bag? That's money. There's Judas. And look at the guy on the left there. What's he doing? He's untying his own sandals. He wants his foot, feet washed. Then there's John, who is looking over Peter's shoulder. And you see in John his astonishment when he is watching this. He's the young one there. And then Jesus, who is intent on the service he is providing. The point of that painting, when you see it, the whole painting, is the astonishment of the disciples, right? That's really part of that story that's told. They're astonished. What's astonishing them? Jesus has been serving people as long as they've known him. He's healed people and done all kinds of wonderful things for people. What was it about this? Look at what Jesus said in, uh, uh, in uh, verses 12 to 16. It starts, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And here it is. I have set you an example that you, has, you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. The tough part of washing feet for one another here is not really the serving part. It's the humility. It's the lowliness. It's the posture. 
What shocked the disciples was Jesus doing servant's work. Work they would never stoop to do. Have you ever noticed when you go to a restaurant and the guy comes up to you and says, I'm Doug, I'll be your waiter, uh, waiter tonight. I'll be your server. He says that. I'll be your server tonight. Have you ever heard any of them say, I'll be your servant? Of course not. That would be demeaning. That would connote a kind of doormat. Like you can order me around. Well, that's what Jesus called us to be. Servants. Not only that, Paul tells us in... Um, Philippians 2, that Jesus himself took on the very nature of a servant. And we are told to be like him. Have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. That is the hard part of loving one another. That's the hard part of loving each other as Christ has loved us. And we're going to be called on to do that. You know, it's wonderful. We get together, we sing together, see people, we're getting to know each other. It's kind of exciting. That's not the hard part. The hard part is when somebody here crosses you, hurts your feelings, does something that jangles and pulls and at worst treats you like a servant. It's terribly hard. Listen, nobody knows that better than pastors. We know what that's like. We know how hard churches can be. But that's what we're called to do as the people of God, to be lowly. What does that mean? What do we have to do? Well, Jesus gave us a very, uh, Paul gave us, Jesus gave us a picture. Paul gave us a job description. The job description is in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. I want you to listen to these words, these uh, uh, categories of loving one another, and notice that they're all relational and they're all costly. To do any of these, there has to be somebody else and any of them are going to cost you something. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, cha-ching, cost you something. Kindness, cha-ching, humility, cha-ching, gentleness, cha-ching, Patience, uh, cha-ching. Bear with each other, uh, cha-ching. And forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, cha-ching. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I call these love's coat of many colors. Every act and attitude there costs us something. Every one of them are going to be needed if our church is going to be what God wants it to be. They all take some dying. They all carry the feel of the cross against our back. But here's a wonderful bonus, brothers and sisters. When we love one another as Christ has loved us, when we do that, we become like Jesus. We become like Jesus. A couple years ago, somebody sent me this photo. This was from our uh, former church in Lincolnshire, and it happened uh, at least 10 years ago. I was preaching this same passage. You see the picture up on the screen, same picture. Somebody over on the side is singing uh, Michael Card's song, The Basin and the Towel. And I thought it would be just really a cool way to end the service if we did the foot washing. So I asked my elders if anybody was willing to have their feet washed, and Ed said he would, so that's Ed. And then I tried to call around to find somebody who'd do the washing part. Uh, you know, I was willing, but you know, the pastor does so many things, I thought it'd just be good to have somebody else. And my goodness, I called several people. It seemed like everybody was going to be out of town. I couldn't find anybody. I ran out of time. So what did I have to do? I had to wash his feet. Well, the problem was that nobody knew was I was holding the grudge against Ed. Ed had been kind of critical of a couple things I did, and I just didn't like it. I don't take criticism very well, and it just sat there in me and festered. So now I'm facing this. I have to kneel at his feet in front of God and everybody and wash his feet. And I knew that I had to get things squared away, that I couldn't do this with that burden. So God and I had some hard work to do. 
alone on Saturday night. When I washed his feet, something was happening. I don't think Ed knew it. Nobody knew it except me. It was hard to take the posture of Jesus there. But in the end, I'll tell you one, something that I didn't expect. In doing that, Jesus served me more than I served Ed. And I became a little more like Jesus. Because that's what happens. I became a little more like Jesus. There's one more statement here. It's in verse 35. Jesus says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It's important, apparently, it's important to Jesus that people know who his disciples are, right? I just saw in back here that I could get those little, what do they call them, window stickers or something I can put on my car, my bumper, so people know I go to Cross Point Church. That's great, I'm going to do that. But that's now how people are going to know I'm a disciple. They're going to know that we're disciples of Jesus by how we love each other. In that same prayer at the end of this, in John 17, verse 23, Jesus asked the Father this. He said, I have given them, his disciples, the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. It's an extraordinary thing. So what? So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's what has to happen. So here's the point. Our love for one another is essential to our witness to the world. Our love for one another is essential to our witness to the world. Pastor Dave and I have talked about this because... He has such a burden for this community. That's one reason I love the guy. I'm so glad to be under him because I need that. I can get really closed in. But it won't do us any good to be reaching out if we're not reaching in. If we aren't loving each other, which we're working at, which you're trying to do, which we're starting on. On the face of this seems like kind of an underwhelming outreach strategy, doesn't it? Don't we need, you know, billboards or stickers or big meetings or concerts or something if we're going to draw people to Jesus? That's what we do. Those things aren't necessarily bad, but this is where it starts. It starts with something that's interior, interior to the church, not outward. That's counterintuitive to the way we think about reaching people and advertising or whatever. But of all the things that we, might be, that we might do to draw people to our faith in Jesus Christ, nothing, get this, nothing is more important than that we are loving one another sacrificially, humbly, persistently, whether or not people see it. Because that'll change us. It is our love for one another that authenticates the God, it's our love for one another, our loving interaction, and our community that will display Christ's love to the world. Here's what I want you to see. One thing. Our love for one another authenticates the gospel to those around us. You think, you'd think it would be easier if he just gave us the power to do miracles. I mean, that's what happened in the early days of Jesus. He did miracles. And he used those to authenticate who he was. Why didn't he just let us do that? Come to Cross Point Church and you can get healed. Wouldn't that be great? But he didn't do that. He said, just love each other. That's miraculous enough in this world. People in Rockford, if they know anything about churches who are here, and they do, I sit on patios at restaurants and coffee shops and I listened last, night, last summer. I was amazed how often I heard people referencing churches. I never heard that where I lived before. It was very secular. People here, are they drawn to churches because of how 
Do Christians there love one another? Are we hoping our music will do it, our children's programs, our preaching? Number one is how we love each other. And that's hard. Not only does our love for one another authenticate that we are Christians, the gospel, but also there's another thing. Our love for each other creates a kind of, I call it a gravitational pull to the gospel. There's just a gravitational pull to Christians who love each other. It, I don't know, I can't explain it. It's more than just what we say. A church that embarks on some kind of outreach strategy while well, within their fellowship there's all kind of conflict, you know what they're doing? They're pulling their punches. Do you know that expression? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a movie or a TV show when you see people fighting, you know, you know they're not really fighting, right? The guy that throws a punch, he pulls his punch. Just before he lands it, he kind of pulls back a hair so nobody actually gets hurt. There's no power in the punch. Boxers, if they wanted to throw the fight for the gamblers, would not hit quite so hard. Well, when we try to be agents of the gospel in the world and our church isn't healthy, it's like pulling our punch. It doesn't have the power it's supposed to have. Even if they don't know about internal troubles, there's just something lacking. Our witness won't have any potency, any real Christ-likeness, because we get that from loving each other. So we have to be changed by the gospel, by these relationships in Christ, in order to really touch others. People around us, the people around us, in my neighborhood and yours, wherever they are, around our church, they are starved for relationships that only Christians can enjoy. We take it for granted. Think how many people have never had anyone say to them, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask my friends to pray for you. They've never heard anybody sit and talk about, you know, it's so great to be in church. I just love those people. They take care of each other. We're doing this for so-and-so or that for somebody. People are starving for this. Back in 2018, I read an article that is even more true today. It said, America is suffering an epidemic of loneliness. America is suffering an epidemic of loneliness. According to a recent large-scale survey from a health care provider, most Americans suffer, it said, from strong feelings of loneliness and a lack of significance in their relationships. Nearly half of people in America they say they sometimes or always feel alone or left out. 13% of Americans say that zero people know them well. Those folks live around us. We stand next to them in the lines at the store. Imagine the impact on people who feel that way to come in contact with a family of the people of God who love each other. People who were once orphans and are now a family in Christ. So, let's wrap up. Let's make sure you have this. I make sure you remember what this sermon is about. What was Jesus' most important command to us? Love one another. Got it? Memorize that? Who must, who must we love? One another. Where? Here in our church. What if we find out we don't like these people? I can assure you that will happen. That's when saints are made, when we learn to love each other. That's how people grow. When folks in churches say, I don't like these people, I'm going somewhere else, they stop growing. They're stunted. I know it's hard. I know better than you do how hard it is. But we stick together and we grow. What if I'd rather worship at home forever? Or... Just be a Christian without really going to church much. 
It can't be done. There's no place in the Bible that describes a person like you. Because Jesus said, love one another. And there's no one another if you're home. Let me end with a story. Jerome was one of the church fathers. He lived about 400 years after Christ. He uh, records in one of his books a story that had been handed down generation to generation about John, who wrote this story. So let me read it to you. The blessed John, the evangelist, lived in Ephesus until extreme old age. His disciples could barely carry him to church, and he could not muster the voice to speak many words. During individual gatherings, he said nothing but, little children love one another. The disciples and brothers in attendance, annoyed that they always heard the same words, finally said, teacher, why do you always say this? And he replied with a line worthy of John, because it is the Lord's commandment, and if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. All right, Lord Jesus, you just can't make it any clearer to us than this. And you have put us in this remarkable time in a church probably none of us have ever experienced before with people we don't know very well, at least in some cases, hindered by these, these days that we must face, this time just like this morning. But Jesus, to be bound together in you, to be a community here that shines not because of programs or music or preaching, but because we love each other. What a wonder that would be. What a gift. What a miracle. So Lord, do that in us. Right now, in the tensions that must already be here below, below the surface, people who wish things were different somehow, I pray you'd give us grace and kindness. Those of us who are older, Father, help us to be merciful, to not gripe, to not be old codgers. Help us to be fathers and mothers to the young believers among us, kind and gracious and patient. Oh, Jesus, work in us what would please you. For the glory of your name and the spread of the gospel in Rockford. Amen.